ask you a question this morning. <clears throat> We've been in the book of Colossians chapter 3. We finished Colossians 3 verse 4. In Colossians 3 verse 5, we shift gears a bit. We start talking about a slightly different subject. And before we do that, I want to spend a couple of weeks talking about who this God is that we worship. The book of Colossians is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about a focus on Jesus Christ. It's all about seeking things that are above. It's all about uh, standing in the truths that we've learned from Jesus Christ. I've done this in the night sessions many years ago, but I don't remember doing it in our Sunday sessions. So for a couple of weeks, I want to talk about who this God is that we're supposed to seek. How does He exist? What is His essence? What makes Him up? What's His character? What are His characteristics? What are His attributes? What does He tell us about Himself in this book that we must know as His children? You have to know your Father. And He tells us about Himself in this book. And so I want to spend a couple of weeks looking at this. And this is the reason why I've chosen to do this. Because I find it, and I bet you do too, I find it increasingly hard in this world to find someone that I trust. I don't know who to trust. I can't trust the media to report the proper and true news to me with no bias, no inflection, no agenda. I can't trust the media, can I? I wonder whether I can trust my doctors because during the whole COVID nightmare, not to bring up a short sore subject, but during the whole quote COVID nightmare and the vaccine nightmare and the mRNA vac, uh, nightmare, you have some doctors saying everyone must be vaccinated. You have other doctors saying absolutely not. It's poison to your DNA strand. Who's right? Well, I know who I think is right. That's not why I'm talking about this today. But the fact is, who, which doctors can we trust and which can't we? Can't trust our politicians. Can't never been able to trust our politicians, have we? I had a political science teacher that asked a question one time. I'm a political science minor in college. And one of the very first questions I was asked at the University of Texas, the whole class was, what is the goal of a politician? Who said that? The answer to the question was re-election. It's the Ted Kennedy syndrome. I want to be a senator for 50 years. Instead of I want to go serve 6, 10 years, I want to go back home to my family, to my business, to whatever I do. I want to be a servant of my country. Instead, uh, I want to be here until I die. I want to milk the system for all it's worth. Can't trust politicians, never have been able to. What about our, our secret societies, not societies, but our secret agencies, FBI, CIA, NSA? Can we trust them? Or have they proven themselves to be uh, politically motivated, politically charged in the people that they go after? They're abusing their power. So... When you ask the question, when I ask myself the question in the last few days as I look out and I wonder who the world can we trust? There's only one answer. Who is it? It's God. It's God the Father. It's God the Son. And it's God the Holy Spirit. And how does He communicate with us? Right here. That's who we trust. Everywhere else, you've got to get a second opinion. But not in the Bible. In the Bible, we can fully trust this God. So in this changing world in which we live, where uncertainty is the order of the day, not certainty, not stability, what we have to look forward to tomorrow is rapid and radical change. That's the way the world is going. How many of you watched that Olympic debacle? How many of you watched any part of that opening ceremony? I did. Amy and I watched part of it. We happen to love the Olympics. The King family, we are Olympic junkies. I, loved wa I love watching the most exceptionally trained athletes in the world compete for medals. I love it. 
I love winners and I love losers. I love the Olympics. But that show that the people of Paris, France put on the other day was nothing short of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was as in the days of Noah when God flooded the earth and killed this evil and this wickedness. As they portray the Lord's Supper, the painting, the great Da Vinci painting of the Lord's Supper. Was it Da Vinci? <coughs> I'm thinking so. I think Michelangelo always comes to mind too. But one of them, you see this great uh, table of the Lord Jesus. He's sitting in the middle. He's got several men on this side, several men on this side. They're not just sitting there like this. They're like up and in, in portrayed in, in, uh, in movement there in the picture in his, in his famous painting. And they did that at these opening ceremonies. They had a woman and they had drag queens and homosexuals all along portraying the disciples of your Savior and mine, the Lord Jesus Christ. They had a female God person, and they had homosexuals and drag queens, and what they started to do, see this is going to get me hot, I don't want to get hot, what they started to do was jump up on the table, all these drag queens, and go back and forth uh, like they're on a runway for modeling. It was an absolute travesty of all things Christian. They slapped you on both cheeks and spit in your face, Christian. That's what they did in Paris, France. It was abhorrent. It was evil. It was wicked. And it was determined and purposeful. It wasn't just an accident. Oh, I thought everybody would like this. We're sorry. It was determined years before, and it was very, very purposeful what they did to Christianity at that opening ceremony. So who can you trust? We used to love to watch the Olympics just turn on, and we still will. We'll watch the games. But we won't watch the closing ceremony because those people are debauched. And I won't watch it. I won't let that garbage into my eyes and into my ears. They hate me and you. And it was on parade. You can't even watch the Olympics. You can't even turn on the television just to watch the Olympic opening ceremony. Who doesn't love that? All the countries coming in with their banners so proudly representing their nations. And Paris and France has this great opportunity to represent their nation, to teach the world about the culture, the Parisian culture, uh, their heritage, their history, the way opening ceremonies do and what they choose to do, what they put on parade. We are woke. And you're not welcome here if you're not. It was abysmal. The worst thing I've ever seen on television screen. There's only one thing that won't change in this world. There's only one thing that won't change in this world. As we continue forward, friends, make no mistake, your pastor thinks, and I know 99% of you think, we are in the end times in some way, shape, or form. None of us have a calendar. Only God has that calendar. Only the Father. But we are marching toward the last days, and uh, make no mistake, it will get worse. The Bible promises that, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it will get worse. The rapture of the church is a rescue mission by the Lord Jesus Christ to snatch away at the final moment, at the last moment, the church. It's a rescue. It's not, ah, I think I'll go get them now. It's a, I must go get them now because they are in danger. It's a rescue the world will continue to get worse. The only thing that won't change, the only thing that you're going to continue to hear about that will not change are the things you read about and learn about in this book about your God. That's it. He is the only unchangeable rock, our God. Not only is God unchanging, but He's unchangeable, as I'll show you in a while. He can't be changed. He's locked into who He is, and it's one of my favorite things about my God, that we won't go a million years, and He says, you know what? God the Father speaking to the Son and speaking to the Holy Spirit. You know what? I'm tired of this. Let's do something different. Let's stop uh, creating and using the energy to keep humanity, this eternal, these glorified human bodies. Let's stop keeping them alive. Let's turn the page. Let's do something different. Is that day coming? 
No. You know why we know it? Because God tells us in the Bible, I'm a God who does not change. The way He exists today, He always has existed and He always will exist. And in this day, these days of constant change, I don't know how a non-churched Christian survives this time. I have no idea how the world is surviving what's going on. I just don't understand it. God Himself tells us these things about Himself in the Bible. We didn't make it up. Our church, I'm not going to give you a list of these things that God is because some church theologian one day said, I think I'd like God to be this and this and this and this. And then he went into the Bible to try to prove it. God speaks about Himself. He reveals Himself to us in this book. He's chosen to tell us certain things about Him. Could an infinite God tell us everything about Himself? No, not in a million years, not in 10 million years. He will never be exhausted. He's infinite and perfect in ways we will never truly understand. We'll always be learning about this God. But He has chosen to, to share with us certain things that we must know about Him. We have to know these, thing about, these things about Him because He knows there will be great difficulties in, lives, in our lives and trials and tribulation. And we have to know these things about this God to survive. To survive emotionally, to survive psychologically, to survive spiritually, to survive mentally. We have to know that there is an unchanging rock we have to know this. And so God tells us, I'm Him. I'm all powerful. I'm, I'm everywhere at all times. I know all things. And you know what else? The best thing of all, I am in love with you, child. And I don't change. Don't worry about the world does to you. Jesus said, don't be, don't be uh, discouraged if the world hates you. Don't be fooled by that. Don't be troubled by that. If they hated me, they'll hate you. And we say, why would the Olympic Games in the city of Paris, the great city of Paris, I'd love to visit the city of Paris. I'm a historian. I wouldn't step foot in that place if you bought me a ticket this afternoon. I won't go there because of what they did to Christianity over the past two days. I don't need to be around people that hate me. But Jesus said, they hated me too. And on parade at the Olympics two days ago was the hatred of your God and mine, Jesus the Christ. They mocked Him. They mocked Him. And we serve a God that will not be mocked. I want to talk about God as a trinity for the next few minutes. How He describes Himself, how He tells, how He reveals to us who He is. He reveals Himself in a, as a trinity and He reveals certain characteristics about Himself in the Bible. And like I said before, I'll say it again, we must know these things. This is the minimum information that every one of us has to know about this God and able to get through in, in, in order to get through this life. We have to know that God exists as these things or we will crumble. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3.11. Anybody know it? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, written by Solomon, says, And God has placed eternity in our hearts. We each have a desire to know where we're from, our origins. Where did man originate? Where did we come from? Where did the first man come from? God has put that itch in us to scratch. We want to know where we came from, and we want to know where we're going when we breathe our last, because we have all buried people, haven't we? We know this isn't it. And we want to know. And the Bible says that God has placed that itch that needs to be scratched inside every one of us. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, He says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. We want to know the beginning and we want to know the end of the story. That's who we are. Every human being that's ever walked wants to know the answer to those two questions. Where did I come from and where am I going? And so God has to step in and say, this is who I am. This is where you come from. This is what your ancestor Adam did wrong. 
This is how I, how I have chosen to fix the problem with Adam's race, mankind, through the God-man, Jesus Christ. This is what I offer you. Believe and be saved. You choose. If you believe and are saved, then you will enter into eternal bliss with me. You'll come to a place with no more tear and no more pain and no more sorrows where all the old things are passed away. I offer you an eternity in my presence, face to face. I see you and you see me. And we interact for all eternity. If you don't believe in the gift I've sent you, Jesus Christ, then you will go to a place that I designed for the devil and his angels. You will go to the lake of fire and you will exist there forever. No one goes away. God created our souls eternal. So you either choose an eternity with me in bliss or you choose an eternity separated from me in the lake of fire. That's man's choice. Every single man that lives, that's his choice. Look at what the Bible says. The first question the man asks is to God, who are you? Who are you? I can imagine Adam, just imagine Adam in the garden. He's non-existent in one moment, and the next moment he's completely existent. He's self-aware. He knows that he's alive, doesn't know how, doesn't know anything. God has to present him with information about who God is, and one of the things that God tells him is, in the last six days, I've been creating. Imagine the information dump that Adam got. It would have been glorious. And God says, through Moses, many years later, he had him write it down. But clearly, he taught these things to Adam. In the beginning, God says, in the, the scripture says, in the beginning, I, God, created the heavens and the earth. Adam's first question, who are you, God? I'm your creator. I'm your maker. I'm the origin. I'm the source of all life. That where once you had no life, now you have life, and that's me. I am the life, and I have given you life. I breathed into you the breaths of lives, and now you are alive. I am your creator. But there's an interesting thing here in this word, Elohim. It says, in the beginning, God, and that's the Hebrew word Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. Let me tell you this about Hebrew. The word for God in Hebrew is El, E-L. If you want to make something plural in the Hebrew language, you don't add an S to it like you do in English. You add an I-M to it. And so here we don't have in the beginning, Ale created the heavens and the earth, not a singular God, not one God. What you have in the Bible is in the beginning, Elohim, this multiple, this, this God of multiplicity somehow, he introduces himself in the first verse as something distinct and set apart that Adam wouldn't understand unless God told him what he meant. So he starts here and says, in the beginning, Elohim, a plurality, created the heavens and the earth. So we see the Trinity for the first time in the very first chapter and verse of the Bible. God, Elohim. I can't explain all of this to you today. Next week, I think we'll talk more about the Trinity itself. But understand that what God is saying here is that I am a plurality in unity. E pluribus unum. You ever wonder what that means on our, on our money? Out of a plurality, a unity. Out of the melting pot of all the nations that have come to America, let's make one people. Let's become Americans together. No longer Italians, no longer Mexicans, no longer, uh, no longer from any place. Let's become one in this melting pot. Let's let all our flavors come together and meld together so that we become Americans. E pluribus unum, out of plurality, one culture, one heritage. And God says here, out of a plurality that I'll explain to you as I continue teaching you, Adam, out of a plurality, the creation was made. So we see here that the Trinity is three. We know later from the scriptures that the Trinity, that God exists is three. Not one, not two, not four, but three. And the three are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is a gigantic truth. 
Let me ask you this. Who is your Savior? Somebody tell me his name. What's his name? His name is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. But beyond him being your Savior, who is he? He's God. What God? Which God? Oh, you say, which God? And you say, oh, wait a minute. There, which God almost sounds like there are multiple gods. How many gods are there? There's one God. But we serve a God who somehow, in a way that we can't understand, is a plurality in unity. He's a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but each of the members of the Godhead share an identical characteristic, an identical list of essences. They are identical in in, in character. But as persons, they're distinct. God the Father is not God the Son. They are distinct. God the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. They are distinct. Now let me tell you why that's a, such an important fact that God is a plurality, yet exists as a unity, one God in three persons forever, if you were Muslim, if you were Jehovah's Witness, if you were Jewish, you know what your problem with your God is? He's only one God in one person. Who does that leave out? If God isn't one God but three distinct persons... If you only have God the Father the way the, yet the Jehovah's Witnesses say, we are witnesses of the one God who exists as the one God. Jesus is merely a creation of the one God. They don't see God as a triune Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So who do you not have room for? The Son of God and God the Holy Spirit, the Savior of the world, and our empowerment, God the Holy Spirit, during our time on earth. Your God doesn't work to save mankind. The Jews refuse to believe that God is triune. The Jews believe to this day that God exists as one. No Father, no Son, no Holy Spirit, although very clearly in the pages of the Old Testament, and I'll show you some, very clearly in the pages of the Old Testament, you have these verses and you say, sure looks like there's three there. How do you get around this? Let me just read one to you. Isaiah chapter 61, write it down. The, plur the, the plurality of the Godhead in one verse. In Isaiah 60, 61 verse 1. Isaiah 61 verse 1. You have the Trinity very clearly in the Old Testament in one verse. The Spirit, who's that? There's God the Holy Spirit. Of the Lord God, who's that? That's the Father, is upon me. Who's that? It's Jesus. It's Messiah speaking prophetically here before He came to earth. God the Holy Spirit, the one who is of God the Father, is upon me, God the Son. What do you have? What's that called? The Trinity. What did your Savior say when He came to earth? Well, I mentioned it when I was mentioning baptism. What did your Savior, Jesus Christ, what was His thoughts on the Trinity? I guess we are going to talk about it for a minute. It's just too important just to pass up. What was Jesus' thought on how eternal God has existed? One God? I mean, one God in the sense that no three persons? Was that Jesus' idea of God? Or did He have a different idea? What's the answer? He says, all authority has been... This is Jesus. This is the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. I am the sovereign ruler of everything now. Go therefore in my name as the ruler able to give, uh, uh, to give commands... The ruler gives a command, Go therefore and make disciples by teaching them about me, Jesus. Make disciples of all the nations, not just the Jews, but every nation on earth. Baptizing them in the name of... Somebody finish it. 
The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute. Jesus must have been confused. The Jews would completely discount Jesus as being a proper theologian because he thinks God is three. Well, so do I, because that's the way God presents himself in the book. As a trinity, in the beginning, on day six, God would also utter this phrase, let us create man in our own image. You have that plurality again. Who's God talking to? Is he a God that talks to himself? Is he a single solitary God that just has a conversation with himself in his mind? Or do we have a plurality of persons there in one eternal God having a conversation with themselves? Is God the Father speaking to God the Holy Spirit and God the Holy Spirit speaking to God the Son in some eternal life conference where they say, let us create man, ish. Let us create man in our image. Father, what do you think? Spirit, what do you think? There is a conversation in, in some sort of convention of sorts. I don't know how else to put it. I speak in human terms, but something went on where the God had communicated to one another, it's time to create. And they were all of one accord because they can never change. They can't be separated from each other. They're all eternally one. It's the great, confu not confusion, it's the great non-explained mystery of our existence on earth. How is it that three can be one? Anybody have an answer? I have an answer. I'm with Kale. I have no idea. I know math well enough to know. I'm not going to explain that intellectually. It's a spiritual truth. It's a spiritually discerned truth that God exists as a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always has, always will. That's a spirit, spiritually discerned truth. It's something we have to take on faith. But there's something else uh, that God gives a, a, a design. God allows the design of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to hit the earth so that the design of plurality bringing unity walks around on earth every day. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know what the design is? The design in, the human, in human nature, the design in our lives so that we can come to understand better little by little what it is to be a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all acting as one. You know what that structure is in humanity? It's the family. It's the family. Now, let me just explain, to you, explain that to you this way. What does God call me in my family? Me, the male of my marriage with a, a man that has children. What am I called? I'm called father. Well, that's an interesting word, isn't it? Pater in the Greek. The same word we use for God the Father. The same word Jesus used when he cried out to the Father in John 17. When he prays his high priestly prayer. He shares that word with me. With every one of you men that has a child, you are the representative on earth of the Father, of His part in the Trinity. Who's the Son? That kid right there. What does God call my male offspring? Sons. Same word. He calls him Son. And then you say, well, Rick, you're going to have to pull a rabbit out of the hat. What about Holy Spirit? How do you equate God the Holy Spirit with your wife? We've talked about the father in the family. We talk about the children in the family. Somebody tell me if you know, how does God equate God the Holy Spirit with the wife? Let me ask you this question. I'll narrow it down. You'll get it. What did God tell Adam he needed in the garden? He said, you need a helpmate. You need a helper. All the animals passed before Adam. He checked them out. He understood their, their characteristics. He gave them a name. But nobody came forward that was capable of being Adam's second half. So God says, I'm going to make you a second half. You need a helper. Now listen to the words of Jesus Christ. I've already, I've already given you this verse earlier. Jesus says, the night before His crucifixion, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, I'll send to you a... 
a helper. God the Holy Spirit is the azer, E-Z-E-R in the Bible, the Hebrew word for helper. He is the helper. I can show you verse after verse where God the Holy Spirit is the helper. So if God the Holy Spirit is called the helper and God says to Adam, you need a helper, and God says to single Rick King, you need a helper, I am gifting you Amy Gathney as your life partner and your helper. She represents God the Holy Spirit in the, in the plurality that is the King family that walks around de- demonstrating to the world how three or four can exist as one. This is it. And your families should demonstrate to the world the same exact fact that in plurality you can have unity. You can have a father, you can have a helper, and you can have children. And that one machine moves so closely aligned, so together in their thinking, what they do, how they act, how they look, how they speak, how they treat each other. They look so identical that you could mistake them one for the other. That's family. That's what it should be. It's interesting, Caleb went to camp, and one of the guys that runs the camp there uh, is a longtime friend of mine, mine, Amy's and mine. We've known Keith for a couple of decades. And Keith had this to say to Caleb. And you've heard this. Your kids have said it. People have said this about you or said this to your kids. Man, he told Caleb, when I see you walking around, you know, I'm just observing you from a distance. Who does he see? He sees the old man. Why is that? Because out of the plurality that makes me an individual person and makes him an individual person before God, there is a unity that's describable. You can see it. Keith said, I watch you do this. I hear the way you speak. I listen to your phrases. You are your father. And there's another little piece to that. As imitators of the Lord God... When people see the Christian, the child of God, they should see in us enough to say, I see your Father in you. I see God the Father in you. I see Jesus the Christ in you. I see the love and the comfort and the patience and the teaching of God the Holy Spirit in you. When I see you, I see the light of the, of the living God. And some of you have heard that in your lives. That's the goal. But see how it all works together? It all works together. The fact that God presented Himself in the beginning as a trinity is huge because as the story unfolds in the garden with Adam and we see Adam fall away from grace by disobeying God and eating the fruit, if God is only one, unique one, only one person, there's no way for Him to save. There's no way for Him to die in humanity's place. How can God die and at the same time be alive? It's impossible. But because God is three persons, it allowed God the Father to remain on His perch in heaven, on His throne, and send the Son to earth to take on human form to become God the Son, or God God the God-man, and die in our place while God the Father and the Holy Spirit, even the, the deity of God the Son, remained purely intact and alive eternally. It was that humanity of Jesus Christ that paid our, our price on the cross. In the very first chapter of the book, very first verse, you read that, and how many times have we just read past that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and just kept on going. I hope I've exploded that verse for you now so that you can see how important it is that God presents Himself as a plural God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet united in our essence eternally. Amazing who this God is. The Trinity can't be separated, yet there are three persons in the Trinity. They share the identical essence. What I mean by essence is they they have the permanent, 
They share the permanence of being, the elements of being, the way that they exist, the elements of their permanent being are shared by all three of them. I'm going to tell you what these elements are. We'll go over them next week. They are sovereign. I could show you verses in the Bible where God the Father says He's the King. I could show you verses in the Bible where God the Son says, I'm the King. And I can show you verses in the Bible where God the Holy Spirit says, don't leave me out, I'm the King. How can that be? Well, they're all sovereign. They're all God. They're all the Creator. They all have the right to rule. That's what sovereign means. They are the supreme rulers of everything that exists. Everything. God is the ruler. He is the ruler over all creation. The next one is righteousness. God the Father, Son, and God the Holy Spirit all share the identical righteousness. That means they are perfectly right. There's no falsehood. There's nothing wrong in the Godhead. They are absolute perfection in every way. They're perfectly just. They are justice. They're perfectly fair. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why the, Holy, that's why the Son can die on a cross and be okay with it. Because the penalty for sin is death, and this is fair. That God the Father would have to sacrifice me as a lamb, that's fair. Because what He promised Adam in the garden was, on the day you eat of the fruit, something will die. You will die, Adam. Your spirit will be separated from me. You will lose your spirit. And unless I re uh, give birth to that spirit again, you will forever live separated from me. So God the Son has to die. And that's why the Son was okay with the plan of the Father. Something has to die. Something has to sacrifice. Something has to take the place of humans or humans can't be saved. He's also perfect love. He desires the highest and best for every member of mankind. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to have intimacy with us. That would be the highest thing we could attain is to have a wonderfully intimate relationship with God. That's what love is. He desires the highest and best. He's also eternal life. He had no beginning, no end. He's also omniscience. He never learns. He knows all things. He is an all-knowing God. He knows what you're going to eat. He knows what you might eat. He knows how many peas are going to be on the plate. He knows everything about everything. There's nothing that God will ever learn. He knows the probable. He knows the actual. He knows the everything. The possible. He knows all Everything, as hard as that is to understand, he knows it all. Whether I'm going to wear brown socks tomorrow or white socks or black socks or tennis shoes or sandals or go barefoot. All those probabilities, God knows all those probabilities and all the different ways that could hurt my foot. He knows what choice I will make and he writes that into his plan. An astounding God when you think about these things that he is. These are the minimum things we have to know about this God to survive this life. That's what he tells us in the Bible. He's omnipotent. He's got all power. There's, no th there's nothing that God wants to do that he doesn't have the power to do. He has all power. He can speak and things can be created out of nothing. He's omnipresent. He's all places at all times. He's veracity. He's perfect truth. There's no falsehood. There's no lying with God. There's not even a shifting shadow of turning with God. There's no uh, appearance of maybe, ah, is that, is that perfect truth or is there a little shade of gray there? There is none of that with the living God. He is perfectly pure truth. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Let's you know who Jesus is, doesn't it? He's also immutable, our last one, which means he can't change. Not only does he not change, but he cannot change. He will always be these things that he outlines to mankind in the Bible. And I'll give you verse after verse after verse next week for all of these things. His eternal life, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his sovereignty, his righteousness, justice, his perfect love. None of these things will ever change. They'll never wane. They'll never diminish. They'll never lose intensity. He will always love you with the fires of a million burning suns. That's, that's who he is. Unchanging God. He's identical in his three persons in character. But yet the three persons are very unique and distinct and have different roles, different roles to play uh, in human history for sure. That's a lot, huh? 
I hope it helps. It's valuable to me to speak these things to you. It's valuable to me to speak these things. In the world in which we live where everything is changing, I just want to throw an anchor off the bow of my boat that will hold your souls steady. That's what I'm doing. The only anchor I know is this book and my God. I'm simply trying to go back into the book to throw that anchor out when the storms are brewing and the waves are tall. We've got to put an anchor back down. It's good for all of us to learn these things yet again afresh to come to understand just who this God is, how magnificent and majestic He is, and the fact that when all seems lost, nothing is lost. God knows exactly what He's doing. Let's close in prayer.